This podcast originated as a video discussion on YouTube. The link to watch the video is in the description box of this show. Enjoy. Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. I had the opportunity to meet activist and YouTuber Rachel Oates at the Faithless Forum in Dallas, Texas. And I knew immediately I wanted to have her on the broadcast. Rachel, it's good to have you, my friend. Good to be here. Thank you. You YouTube about a lot of different subjects. Mm-hmm. Specifically what? Um, so what about kind of science and I debunk a lot of bad science and pseudoscience. Um, I also talk a lot about like atheism and stuff and tend to debunk sort of harmful religious ideologies and practices and teachings and that kind of stuff. Um, I tend to kind of focus on the people behind the ideas. So it's less about the kind of arguments and more about how they impact real people so i have a lot of like pro lgbt content a lot of feminist content um same time it's just kind of all a little bit of fun and um i try and do a bit of everything really you remind yeah. me a little bit of uh, sarah roxdale who does kind of the same stuff she does a lot of lifestyle yeah. type stuff and, mm-hmm. and health and beauty and then she also does like you know hardcore cults and getting into <laughs> atheistic stuff and it's yeah. a weird meshing of cultures so to speak Mm -hmm. i i like it though like it's all a big part of me and some people kind of like see me at first glance and they see like fancy makeup and like pretty clothes or whatever and they're like oh well you know you can't take us seriously and i'm like no screw that i'm just as good as anyone else i'm well educated i know what i'm talking about you don't have to give up like the feminine or the fluffy parts of you to talk about serious stuff and really make an impact and um that's the thing that I t- kind of want to get across to a lot of my younger viewers because they always think that they have to kind of change themselves if they want to be taken seriously or whatever. And I'm like, no, be yourself. And if people can't accept parts of you, that's their problem. You just keep doing what you're doing. And yeah. Be an authentic um, person. I like that. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, start here. The actual interview portion with mm-hmm. two words. Those words are Kent Hovind. <laughs> uh, Kent Hovind is a young earth creationist. He is also an ex-con. He did 10 years for tax evasion and obstructing federal authorities, I think, as they were investigating the tax evasion. Went into the pokey in 2007. He was released in 2017. His son, Eric, has been on the scene uh, kind of in his stead over the past decade. In fact, I've seen Eric Hoven show up at atheist events or outside them, and he's got his video crew and whatnot. <laughs> now, Eric uh, Hovind is not as extreme, I don't think, as his father, Kent, who has some really wackadoodle ideas about the world. They called him Dr. Dino. Uh, he established back in 19, I'm sorry, back in 2001, the Dinosaur Adventure Land in Pensacola. The slogan for the park is where dinosaurs in the Bible meet. And he sells books and videos and fossil replicas. Now, he has no... Training whatsoever in paleontology. None. Zero. Zip. Nada. He has none. He got his doctorate from Patriot University in Colorado Springs. Now, if you go to Kent Hovind's wiki page, you will see a photograph of this university. It's essentially a single wide mobile home. And he got the doctorate via correspondence course, both his master's and his doctorate. So Dr. Dino's doctorate is hugely in question. And it's interesting because when he got out of prison, he just sort of picked up right where he left off. Young Earth creation Mm -hmm. and sort of debunking the atheist. And I saw that YouTube been having this online volley back and forth. Uh, Did it start with you challenging something he had said? Um, Yeah. So I got sent a PDF of one of his like little booklets called um, 
are you being brainwashed propaganda in science textbooks and it's all about how science te- textbooks lying to kids and it's full of this terrible bad science and he goes through I think it's something like 18 different lies that apparently textbooks are spouting and teaching kids and he tries to debunk them and mostly they're about evolution and some geology and some biology and stuff like that Um, and so I read this book and I was like this is absolute crap and I decided to, to like debunk it a bit and go through it page by page and be like okay this is what's wrong with this. And I like fact checked his sources and his information and all this kind of stuff. Um, and he keeps making video responses to me and I keep ignoring them and he's getting really mad. I've noticed that if I Google search your name, mm-hmm. his videos, he must be keywording the hell out of those videos because oh, yeah. his are he's, popping up. So what I find really funny is um, <laughs> he keeps like, going back and watching videos of mine from like a year ago and he's trying to like dig up everything on me he can and he like screenshots pictures of me from like my old videos where I'm like pulling stupid faces and then paste them over my thumbnails and then puts them like into his videos so he's like trying to get views off like making me look stupid and it's really bizarre he's I think obsessed. it's because yeah but he doesn't have any good science to back up anything he's saying because his arguments haven't changed in the last 20 years. They don't update with science. So his ideas are all completely outdated. They were outdated when he first started spouting them, never mind now. Um, but he has nothing new to say. So all he can really do is, is resort to ad hominems and, you know, try and make me feel bad about myself and my face and my accent. And he like mocked me for dyeing my hair and stuff. And I'm like, mate, just because you can't do science doesn't mean you have to mock my hair. I'm going to come back to that because you bring up a, a salient point. But there's a section on the Kent Hovind wiki page that I just have to read verbatim. If you'll be patient, everybody, mm-hmm. I just have to read his theory called the Hovind theory. It's, I'm sure he named it, right? It's the Hovind theory. <laughs> um, it's featured in the book Unmasking the False Religion of Evolution. It says dinosaurs and humans coexisted. And the Tyrannosaurus Rex was a vegetarian prior to the fall of man. Kent Hovind expands upon the early 20th century vapor canopy concept of a protective shield that made the Earth a relative paradise between the expulsion from paradise and Noah's flood. Okay, so between uh, Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the garden and Noah's flood, We had a vapor canopy apparently over the earth. The flood is expressed as a function of natural rather than miraculous processes. Noah's family and two of every kind, not species, kind of animal, including the dinosaurs, which were babies so they could fit on the ark, boarded the boat before an ice meteor impacted the earth. Fragments from the meteor caused planetary rings and impact craters on the moon and other solar system bodies. The remainder were drawn to the north and south poles by the Earth's magnetic field as cataclysmic snowfall, which buried the mammoths standing up. The ice on the poles cracked the Earth's crust, releasing the fountains of the deep, which, according to Hoven, caused an ice age, made the Earth wobble around, and that collapsed the vapor canopy that protected it. In the next few months of the flood, the dead animals and plants were buried. They became oil, coal, and fossils. The last months of the flood included geological instability when the plate shifted, and that formed the ocean basins and mountain ranges. Okay, so the bat shittery is strong with this one, uh, Rachel. Mm-hmm. It is a wacky yeah. out there. I mean, even for young Earth mm-hmm. creationism. What I find very interesting about him is that he always manages to have a little tiny grain of actual science in there, like not much. And it doesn't even have to be anything appropriate, but he always gets just something right. And then he's like, okay, well, if I, if I know this little bit and this is my conclusion, what do I have to make up to get there? And then he comes up with some crazy, like weird logic that kind of somehow makes this like tiny, tiny little bit of science, like fit his creation agenda. And it's really bizarre because a lot of people will look at that at a glance and if they don't understand the actual science behind it they'll think he's correct and being all technical and they're like oh well he must know what he's talking about and just believe him and that to me is one of the most dangerous things i know that he uh, used to talk a lot about carbon dating 
and how it's mm-hmm. so unreliable when used to date fossils. And of course, you're like, we don't use carbon dating on fossils because carbon yeah. dating is used on much younger items. Younger being, yeah. I guess that's the word I'm looking for. But you know, you, that's not yeah. the correct dating method for the fossil. It doesn't make any mm-hmm. sense. His whole argument, his whole premise is yeah. false, you know. Yeah, he'll use kind of like weird anecdotes as well. Like he'll talk about Piltdown Man and be like, okay, well, it was it was a fraud. It was fake. It's been debunked. Therefore, all human like fossils that we found could be fake. And, you know, they're probably fake. And he tried to compare Lucy to Piltdown Man. And it was just so bizarre. And he completely like ignored all the corroborating evidence we have for um, uh, what was Lucy again? She was Australopithecus afarensis, I think. And, you know, we don't just have that one very kind of like, not complete, but very full fossil. We have other bits of evidence as well. Like we have fossils of footprints that fit what that species of, um, I guess if you want to call it human or ape or whatever. Like we have fossils of footprints that fit what their foot size and step and gait and walking style would have been like. And we can date those back to the same age as the fossils so we kind of like have all this evidence and he just ignores it and he's like no no this other one was a hoax therefore this could be a hoax and it's really bizarre it's really really bizarre it's interesting to watch my buddy Aaron raw when it comes to kent hoven you know Aaron's big and oh i love Aaron. yeah and you know you can Aaron, you can see that mm-hmm. vein in his forehead mm-hmm. pop out, and he's. I think he yeah. one day will spontaneously combust. Let's switch <laughs> gears for just a second to Rachel Oates. Mm-hmm. You released a video about Michael Pearl. He is a, a Baptist yes. fundamentalist evangelist and author. He and his wife Debbie are authors of a hugely controversial book called "To Train Up a Child." You uh, produced a video about this. You called it mm-hmm. Michael Pearl's Guide to Abusing Children. You want to explain this? Um, yeah, so it is probably one of the most horrific books I've ever read, and it literally broke my heart to read it. It's been linked to the deaths of, I think, around seven children. Uh, they were all foster children or adopted children, and the parents used the techniques that Michael and Debbie Pearl outlined in that book, and it led to the deaths of these seven children. And in it, he outlines things like... Um, So if your newborn baby is biting while breastfeeding, pull their hair, yank their head back, hurt them until they stop. Um, He outlines what kind of stick you should use to beat your child at various ages. For example, if they're under six months, use a willow branch. If they're over six months, you can use something bigger and thicker. Um, If they're over seven, you can use an acrylic piece of pipe. Um, And he literally outlines not only what to hit them with, but how to hit them, how hard to hit them, how to hit them without leaving marks so other people see. He gives anecdotes about how um, when his kids were younger, he would literally trick them into doing things wrong so he could punish them because apparently that was how they learn and that's the only way to teach a child. Um, You wouldn't raise an animal that way. You wouldn't raise a dog that way, never mind a kid. Um, There's one where he was saying he would his kids that the pond in their back garden was dangerous by waiting until they fell in but one of his kids had seen the others fall in and didn't want to go near it so she was always really careful around it so to teach her a lesson he pushed her in the pond and nearly let her drown before pulling her out and it's It's terrifying it's absolutely terrifying so he's conditioned we're going to toughen them up it's conditioned response it's spare the Mm -hmm. rod spoil the child in the name of god Yeah. yeah Oh, yeah. And they use biblical quotes to try and back everything up. It's disturbing. And that's not their only book. When you put that alongside the other books they've written, like there's one called um, it's something about stopping them jumping ship. And it's basically like how to indoctrinate your child from a young age so that once they're old enough to leave the family, they won't leave and they won't leave the church. It's literally a guide to indoctrination. Uh, there's another one that his wife, Debbie, has written called Created to Be His Help Me, which is how I found Michael and Debbie in the first place. And it's basically all about biblical submission and how women owe it to their husbands to behave a certain way and basically act like they're slaves. And again, just like some of the things she talks about are ridiculous. Re- ridiculous and um it's kind of disturbing because it doesn't seem like they have a family it seems like they have michael and then a bunch of his slaves and that's it and he just controls everyone and like 
what he says goes. People aren't allowed to think for themselves. And he wants everyone to have a family like that. And what's terrifying is not only are they these books, but they're teaching these things to other people and other families. And they have families who come to them and say, look, I'm having this problem with my kid. I'm having this problem with my kid. I'm having this problem with my husband, my wife. And they literally like get involved in these other people's lives and give this terrible advice. And a lot of it involves kids being hurt. And it's terrifying and disturbing and disgusting. You talked a little bit about uh, Debbie Pearl, and I will get to the switchboard mm-hmm. here in a minute. She reminds me of the transformed wife. It's yes. funny. I had repeated. Very, uh, very similar. Retweeted something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. She had some back ass word uh, tweet mm-hmm. about uh, submission and how their body, your bodies are made for childbearing. And so you should yeah. essentially check out of, of any sort of uh, professional or. I know yeah. anything outside the home check out because you know you were so beautifully made to be able to just essentially be a baby factory and I responded yeah uh like the transformed wife would respond and I said look ladies god made your feet so small so you could stand closer to the sink and mm-hmm. <laughs> it got like you know yeah. I don't know how many retweets but that's the mindset the transformed yeah. wife and you've you've tackled this one as well right Yes, quite a lot. She recently did um, a video on why birth control is awful and no one should ever use it ever because apparently we're ruining our bodies and everything. And um, women, we shouldn't get an education. We shouldn't um, get in any kind of debt. We should just be like getting married as soon as possible and popping out babies as soon as possible. According to Laurie, the transformed wife, there is no reason for women to be on birth control ever, even if it's for health reasons and medical reasons and stuff like that. She's like, no, there's no no need for it. Um, and she's like, and in the rare cases where women have had a few kids and it's like dangerous for them to have any more for like health reasons or whatever, she says, if that's the case, just get your tubes tied. You don't need to be on birth control. Easy so for it's her like, to say that. Yeah. yeah. She's just swinging from like one extreme to the other. It's so bizarre and it's ridiculous. And she just doesn't want women to have women to have any kind of freedom or independence or to think for themselves. She thinks women ha- having a terrible thing. She thinks women should be having six, seven, eight kids. She not only like mocks women like me who don't want kids, but she says that women who only have one or two kids are also doing something wrong. So she's basically critical of everyone. We did a uh, broadcast, I think it was last year. Uh, I forget what I named the uh, main title, but the subtitle was Mm -hmm. The Sin of Being Child Free. You and I have Mm -hmm. this in common. We I've always felt that if you're going to have a child, it needs to be the desire of your heart and yeah. not societal expectation or guilt or because the Bible tells me so. And yeah. so I always allowed for, uh, and my, then my first wife, we always allowed for, well, you know, if that time comes, we'll make the decision to start a family. But until it comes, no. And everybody was like, and you probably heard some of this, oh, you'll change your mind one of these days. Yeah. They're just, you're going to ha- get baby fever and it's just going to happen. Mm-hmm. And then five, eight, 10, 15 years passes and they start to look at you with this raised eyebrow, like, like you're the problem. Like, wh- yeah. do you hate children? Do you, are, what's the matter with you? Are you broken? Mm-hmm. Are you that selfish? Have you had mm-hmm. some of those conversations? Oh, constantly. Yeah. The minute I got in a serious relationship, my sister-in-law was like, so when are you having kids? When is Isaac going to, my nephew, like, when is he going to have a cousin? He really wants a cousin. Can you give him a cousin? I'm like, no. I was like 22 at the time. And I was like, no, like, I'm not sure I ever want kids. And then um, with the partner I was with, we were like, okay, well, we'll give it like 10 years. And then if it happens, it happens. But the older I got, the more I was like, and like, you know, I was getting closer to 30 and I still am. And I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to be ready. Um, And that was when I kind of like, kind of made a definite decision and was like, you know what? I don't want to wait and see. I just don't want it. Um, And what's interesting is that most of the people who tell me I've changed my mind are men, which I didn't really expect. Women who were kind of judging me a little bit and being like, oh, well, you know, I want to be a mother, so surely you want to be a mother. But surprisingly, women, or at least the women I know, are more likely to get it. It's the men who are like, oh, well, you'll change your mind. You just need to grow up a bit. But I'm like, no, you're not the one who has to like carry the kid and sacrifice your body and put your body through all that trauma to 
you know, grow something and give birth to something that you're not even sure you want. Like, it's such a big responsibility. I get it's a big responsibility for men as well because, you know, they're going to have to look after it for 18 years. But I feel like it's double that for women because that's what women do, preg- right? I mean, yeah, in some being cultures. pregnant is such a terrifying thing, and I don't think I'm strong enough to do it. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm rambling a bit. I'm no, not sure where I was going with all. that. Sorry, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting. I mean, I encourage people to go back and, and mm-hmm. listen to the show. Um, it, quite often, and the reason we dealt with it here on this broadcast is not just because it interests me as the host, but because it's often a biblical edict. You are commanded. And of course the women being subservient to the man, the man's the head of the house. You know, you've seen that umbrella graphic, right? There's God is the head of man and man Mm -hmm. is the head of woman. And, and uh, then there are the children and the children are sort of an inevitability. Like, well, of course you're going to go out and have children. People telling you who you are. They tell you what your reproductive choices should be. They overstep these boundaries in the name of religion. So I think Mm -hmm. it is relevant. Uh, You have time to uh, take a few phone calls. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go to 806 on the switchboard. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast with guest Rachel Oates. Who's this? Oh, um, it's Shy. Shy, thanks for calling. Do you have a comment or question for Rachel? Yeah, it's kind of weird that you mentioned the Michael Pearl book on abusing kids because that was the first video from Rachel Oates that I watched. Oh, that's amazing. That was quite a while ago, so you've been around for a while. A little while, yeah. I was at work and I was looking. I was listening at breakdowns of horror movies, and yours was not recommended. I was like, "This doesn't sound like whatever." I'll watch it. Wait, oh, hang on, hold on, hold, wait, 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 hang on. How do we get from <laughs> Michael that? Pearl to horror movies in relation to Rachel? Oh, I don't know. They're very similar. Have you read the book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. Um, okay, so you stumbled upon her work when it was uh, she was talking about Michael Pearl and the book to train up a child. Anything else for us? Um, yeah, and I agree with you, Rachel, about the whole not wanting kids thing. I've been getting pushed for it when I first started going out with my, my now husband, and I'm only 23. Yeah. And I've got classmates who have two kids already, and like, so are you going to have any? Oh, I don't want any. <laughs> And if that changes, you're well, allowing for that, but it's still your choice, right? So, yeah, and I just told them, oh, you know, I've got a, I've got a reptile that's gonna be, that's gonna live to be thirty. I think I'll have to take care of him. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> awesome. Well, I that's appreciate amazing. your call very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank no you. Problem. <laughs> you know, I've uh, we were always we're always. I know you tell me what your dog's name is, Rachel. Kyra. Kyra's precious. Mm-hmm. Uh, what kind of dog is Kyra? <laughs> Uh, Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Oh, my God. I, oh, I love her to bits. What she is the best girl. I had no idea about Staffies when I was looking to adopt, but um, they, like, I, when I went to Battersea Dogs Home, they, like, do an interview with you and match your personality with the dog's personality. And they're like, we've got this dog that, don't know what you're going to think of her, but just meet her. And, like, the minute I did, I was like, this is my dog. Like, me and her just clicked, and we, like, immediately chose each other. And the minute she kind of came into the room, she ran straight towards me, jumped on my knee, was, like, in my arms. And I was just like, this is my dog. And she was like, this is my person. There and was music. There was harps. There was angel song. It was yes, perfect. It was, it was beautiful, yeah. Well, you, uh, you're you like me. I am post animal photos every five minutes, I'm sure. And you can tell the audience oh God, splits. Like 85% yeah. of the people are like, post more photos of Linus. Mm-hmm. And the other 15% are like, Jesus Christ, give mm-hmm. us a break with the dog photos. Yeah. Go figure. So. She's been like um, jumping into my re- videos recently because I'll get halfway through filming. And she's like, okay, I'm ready for a cuddle now. So she'll come and sit on my knee. And like half my comments are like, oh, my God, more Kyra. We need more Kyra. Best bit of the video. And then you'll always get one grumpy person that's like, couldn't concentrate on anything you said with that dog on your knee. And I'm like, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, well, sorry. That's just how, that's just, you know, mm-hmm. cost benefit. That's who she is. So. Yeah. Let's talk mm-hmm. about this anti-vaxxer group that you temporarily joined. You didn't join because you're an anti-vaxxer. Mm-hmm. You joined because you were conducting an experiment. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that. What happened? Um, so I'm still a member of the group, and they don't know. Um, I have, like, this fake Facebook account that I used to join very interesting groups like anti-vaxxers and urine therapy and um yeah i just i quite like to observe 
what happens there. I find it very interesting. And with things like urine therapy, I've talked about that before. So they're the people who believe that drinking your own pee or rubbing it into your skin or even like putting drops in your eyes or some people go as far to inject their own pee. They think that's going to, cu- yeah, I know. They think that's going to cure stuff like cancer or whatever. And it's ridiculous, I know. But on the one hand, I'm like, okay, well, they're only harming themselves. Anti vaxxers terrify me because they're putting so many people at risk and they don't realize. And I have a six month old niece. And like, what they don't realize is that it's not just their own kids they're putting at risk by not vaccinating. It's people like my niece. And that's why I want to kind of like calm them out. Uh, sorry, call them out and look at their harmful like practices and thoughts and be like, no, this is the science behind it. This is why you're wrong. And when people like go on about. So a lot of the things they complain about in these groups are people who like don't want their unvaccinated kids around. And they're like, it's discrimination. It's this, it's this. And I'm like, no, they just don't want their kids to die. And I think it's very important that we take a look at why anti-vaxxers think this way and understand them and their thought patterns so that we can understand how to get through to them so they stop endangering people and children. Now, that's interesting. Can you believe in the 21st century that we are dealing with people who think the earth is flat and that vaccines cause autism, et cetera, et cetera, you know? Yeah, Um, it's 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 an interesting one and it's a terrifying one. But I do find it interesting. So I did a video probably going back about 18 months now on why some people are flat earthers. And it's this idea of kind of outsider scientists and people who are questioning things. They are skeptical and they do want to understand the science and they're trying to figure things out for themselves. They don't just want to take everything at face value. It's just that somewhere along the lines, something goes wrong and they end up at the wrong conclusions. You know, they don't, (laughs) these aren't necessarily people who are crazy. They're skeptics. Just something goes wrong. And I think that's skeptical is a fantastic thing to have. We just need to make sure that we're educating people from a young age to be scientifically literate. We need to teach them not only what to think, but how to think. And I think that's something that the UK education system is starting to do better. This idea of teaching someone how to think, teaching someone the scientific method and processes and how things work. Whereas I think countries like America have more of an issue with just teaching regurgitation of facts, which is why you get people who are skeptical, who want to say like, no, how did we come to these answers? Why do we think this? But because they don't know kind of how to critically assess that they don't necessarily know how to think so much that's why we end up with anti-vaxxers and flat earthers and people coming to the wrong conclusions so i think if we want to get rid of it we just education from a young age better science education and when you see a lot of religious fundamentalists who are pulling their kids out of school and homeschooling and just they are teaching them these regurgitations of facts and stuff from the Bible and using outdated books and resources and using resources from people like Kent Hovind and Ken Ham. That's the problem. You know, it's all a big cyclical mess. Well, you're right about <laughs> you know? the United States. Education in this country is geared around they teach you how to pass a test. It's usually yeah. memorization. You pass the test. You forget. I mean, a great example is foreign language classes. You can take three years of Spanish in high school, and then you're asked at the mm-hmm. age of 22 to say something in Spanish, and you can only remember a smattering of a few yeah. words. You're not communicating, but you've had three years of a foreign language It's because yeah. you were taking the test. You know, It's also interesting that you talk about skepticism and how it can, it can sometimes go into overdrive mode and be mm-hmm. counterproductive. Those people who become so quote-unquote skeptical that – they then resist or reject outright the known facts and the actual data. That's how we get 9-11 truthers, uh, yep. flat earthers, et cetera. You know, someone is so skeptical, they outsmart themselves. And I'm glad to hear a circle yeah. drawn around that, you know, because that's, that's you know, being a skeptic also means we have to be skeptical of our, our own biases and our own flaws. And, you know, at some point you do have to mm-hmm. trust the scientific method, I would think. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but I think in order to trust it, you need to understand what it is. And not enough schools go into teaching what it is. Um, this is going to sound stupid, but 
I'd always heard of the scientific method, but I didn't really know what it was until I got to my GCSEs. And then it kind of hit me and I was like, wait, what actually is this? And I had to go away and kind of research it, research it in my own time and kind of thoroughly understand the process and why we do certain things. Because until then, it had just been taught to me as kind of like, okay, well, these people did an experiment and it showed this. I didn't really understand why we had to do certain things and why we had certain variables and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I find that kind of interesting. Short break. When I come right back, we're going to talk with Rachel Oates about The Little Mermaid, the dark, dark history of The Little Mermaid. Also, we're going to get into the F word, feminism, and cancel culture, this weird environment, especially online in which we live, where one mistake might ruin your life. Rachel's got some opinions about this. We're going to get into it after this. Hang on. Heads up, I'm speaking in Grand Rapids and Farmington Hills, Michigan on the 11th and 12th of September. It's going to be so much fun. I'm also getting ready for the Florida Free Thought Convention the first weekend in November. And Matt Dillahunty and I are going to Phoenix on November the 9th. And if you're anywhere near any of these tour stops, I would love a chance to shake your hand. We're going to have a great time. All the details are at my personal website. Go to sethandrews.net slash events talking here with youtube activist i guess i call you youtube activist uh rachel Oates. so you ruined the little mermaid right or no you didn't ruin the little mermaid but i mean you did a video about the dark origins of the mermaid Mm -hmm. all right kill our childhood rachel what are you talking about yeah, so a lot of people were really mad that Disney cast a black actress as Ariel in The Little Mermaid. So I was like, actually, the Disney story original, Hans Christian Andersen wrote the original, and it was a lot darker than the Disney version. And before he even wrote that, there have been mermaid myths going back uh, literally thousands of years into all civilizations. And in some cases... They were more like fishmen in others. They were, you know, women with fish tails. Uh, but mostly mermaids were terrifying and scary and powerful and they could kill you on a whim. And they would seduce men or they would manipulate people or sometimes they would be benevolent and kind of help people out and teach them stuff. Mostly mermaids were to be feared. And Hans Christian Andersen kind of twisted that myth even further and he made it into a story about a mermaid who was a little bit superficial and she falls in love with a prince who she only kind of saw once from a distance and basically there are no good or bad characters in the story it's a big messy bundle of pain and suffering for everyone really (laughs) which isn't very happy so instead of Uh, the mermaid going to the sea witch and getting legs the sea witch literally kind of like casts a spell on her which splits her fin in two it rips her in half essentially so she has legs she can barely walk she's in pain it's like walking on needles the whole time Uh, she has her tongue literally ripped from her throat so she can't speak or talk or communicate Um, and basically with the prince rejecting her marrying another woman and the mermaid is washed away as sea foam. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So that's uh, a happy ending. Yeah, I, I didn't, they didn't teach us this story when I was a kid. They, you know, this isn't the yeah. Disney version. But it, it, honestly, in many ways, it's a lot more interesting. It reminds me of the merman yes. from the uh, film Cabin in the Woods at the end. He's crawling mm-hmm. along and he's, you know looks like the creature from the Black Lagoon kind of <laughs> thing. One of your videos is the Hot Feminist Book Review. Hot mm-hmm. Feminist is a book by Polly Vernon. Uh, The word feminist already, all I have to do is say the word and there's a parting of the seas and people polarize and start screaming. And now many of my my listeners are no longer listening. They are now preparing what they are about to say about feminism. So let's all just take a second, enhance our calm for just a few. Mm -hmm. Tell me first about the book and why you felt compelled to do a review of it. 
Um, so I've been reading Polly's uh, columns in Grazia magazine for probably about two years now. And I think she has some really interesting opinions. She is a really, really strong opinionated woman. And I don't agree with everything she says, but I do appreciate her kind of apologetic tone. So when I saw she'd written a book, I was like, yes, I'm reading it. And yeah, she kind of talks a lot about, um, she calls it like the fear of getting it wrong, which is where a lot of people now are so quick to judge others online and want to immediately like cancel them when they do something wrong. Um, that a lot of people now just live in this fear of not wanting to say anything in case we get it wrong. And she brings it back to feminism in terms of there are a lot of women now who turn around and be like, well, you're not a real feminist if you do this. And it can be something trivial like shaving your body hair or wearing heels or liking red lipstick. Or it can be something big and be like, well, okay, if you don't support such and such a person, you're not a feminist. If you don't agree with me on this is issue, you're not a real feminist. And then on the other hand, you have the people who hear the word feminist and they're like, oh, well, if you call yourself a feminist, you're a terrible person. If you call yourself a feminist, you must think this. And Polly is whole about kind of reclaiming the word and making it about equality again, but making it about whatever you want it to be. So if you want to be all about, um, I don't know, like arguing against rape culture and violence against women and that sort of thing, you can be. It doesn't mean you have to go along with the people who think that shaving your body hair is wrong or the people who think that real feminists don't wear makeup. You don't have to be in every camp to be a feminist. You can kind of pick and choose the bits that you think are important to you, if that makes sense. And that's something that I really kind of stand behind and can get behind. And she talks about men's issues as well and how um, there's still a hell of a lot of stigma around men's mental health issues. And um, so she's not like exclusionary like that. The one thing I think she could have touched on a bit more is um, kind of issues for transgender women and how, you know, there are still a hell of a lot of people out there who don't see transgender women as women. And that's not okay. And I think perhaps she could have touched on that a bit more and maybe been a little bit more critical of like TERFs and stuff like that. But on the whole, I thought it was a pretty like solid book. It's probably more appropriate now than when she wrote it about, what was it, three years ago it came out. I think it's getting more relevant with time. And she got a hell of a lot of backlash when it first came out. And, sorry, that's my air freshener going off. Um, <laughs> sorry, it always, it's an automatic one. It always scares me. Um, yeah, she got a hell of a lot of backlash when the book first came out. And people were really mad at her for it because, you know, it's a provocative title. And she's essentially calling out everyone, if that makes sense. Well, you know, and, we live in a binary culture. You know, it's you are. Yeah. If you're only 98 percent with me, you're mm -hmm. against me in the exactly, eyes of many. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and she was basically saying, look, I could be like 50% in agreement with you or 70% in agreement with you or 98% in agreement with you. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we focus on the things that we agree on and about the things we disagree on. And I think that's something that a lot of people are forgetting now. And the whole drama we've had recently around rationality rules and that sort of stuff, I, I don't know if you want to go into that, but I think that's very, um, it, it's a perfect example of this either like you're with us or against us thing. It's like a certain group of YouTubers are basically saying, if you don't agree with us on 100% of these issues, you must be against us. And that's just not how the world works. We can say, okay, I agree with you on 99% of stuff, but on this 1%, I'm not sure, or I disagree. And they seem to be focusing on that 1% instead of the 99%. And Polly's book and kind of the message I'm trying to get across in general with a lot of my videos is that I want to focus on building communities where people agree with each other and build each other up. And when there is disagreement, it's not about saying, okay, well, I disagree with you on this or I didn't like this thing. Cancel you. It's not about that. It's about saying, okay, well, I disagree with you on this or maybe you got this wrong. Here's how I educate you. Here's how we make this better. Here's how we discuss things. And um, yeah, I think more people maybe need to focus on that. And it's a tough thing to do, but... I um. I'm giving a speech around the country that talks about this very issue. Sarah yeah. Hader had a, a term that I just love 
about those who will comb through your lifetime of tweets to try to mm-hmm. find some mistake that you've made. She calls it an offense archaeologist. And I thought, yeah, that's <laughs> That's That's brilliant. And there's a lot of people who are offense archaeologists. You know, they're waiting for that gotcha. What Mm -hmm. I find is that they are eager to assign ill intent, meaning that there's no good faith thinking that, well, you know, he was just wrong or Mm -hmm. thought he was doing the right thing, but screwed up or she screwed up or just made a mistake or didn't know what they were saying or misspoke and meant something else. You know, we seem to see Mm -hmm. an absence of good faith in this call out culture that's uh, this cancel culture, as you say. And uh, that's one of the things that I'm I'm really desperate to see reintroduced to discussions, whether we're talking to atheists, whether we're talking to religious people in and out of the LGBTQ community, et cetera, to not mm-hmm. immediately assume or assign some sort of, I don't know, villainhood to the person yes. that we're dealing with, right? Exactly, yeah. So many times now, it, it is like you say, people want a villain, they want a bad guy. And the truth is, like, in the real world, there aren't really villains in general. Like, even the worst people have done something good at some point. And I think the most important thing to do is to try and focus on the good things and the things we have in common and building people up. And that's not to say just ignore everything bad, but when someone does screw up, educate them, you know? Don't just throw them out and tell them their life's over. Don't just say your career's over because you did this one thing. I think everyone better and everyone should be working to get better all the time and we can't do that alone we have to help each other out and help everyone grow and yeah um i'm doing a video soon with uh, ocean he's another youtuber he's a polytheist and a lot of people are a little bit confused because they're like well why do you want a polytheist on your channel you're an atheist and i'm like well yeah that's the thing we have this big massive fundamental difference in our beliefs but we also have a hell of a lot of things in common we both like the idea of building community. We both share a lot of the same values. We're both very like pro LGBT stuff. Um, and we, we share a lot of the same interests and things like that. And that's why I want to have him on my channel and do a video with him and sit down and have a conversation about this kind of stuff to show that even when you have big fundamental differences, you can still have shared goals and things in common. And um, hopefully it's going to kind of like help bring the kind of different communities on YouTube together a little bit more and uh, it should be fun. And also Ocean's just a really nice guy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Just a few more minutes with Rachel Oates. You know, when people come after me, it doesn't happen as much on my channel as some of the other activists, male activists. When we say something that they don't like, we're talking about whatever. Uh, They'll come after me and say, you're an idiot. You're stupid. (laughs) Your position is stupid. Uh, It's usually about the idea or the whole person. When they come after you and a lot of female activists, it's almost, well, in a great many cases, rooted in your appearance, your yeah. eyes, your hair, your your dress. Mm-hmm. It's My teeth is a big one for me. <laughs> it's an attack. Uh, it, they go first for, you know, th- your makeup is a big one. Mm-hmm. So much, I think, that you've done videos about it. Can we yeah. talk about the challenges of the female activist in the, sort of the online culture that we live? Yeah, it's um, it's definitely something I didn't expect. And I spoke about this a little bit at Faithless Forum, actually. But when I was growing up, I was very lucky that I had a lot of like strong female role models and other strong women around me. And like when I was at school... Like, it was me and another girl and another girl. And we were, like, always top of the class, you know. We were always the smart ones, and we always got the best grades and all that kind of stuff. So I just kind of grew up thinking, well, okay, women are smart. That's a thing. And then you get out in the real world, and you're like, hang on a minute. A lot of people assume if you're a woman, you're dumber than them. And then more people assume, like, okay, well, if you're a woman who likes makeup and pretty dresses, you must be dumb. A lot of people assume if you're wearing makeup, you're compensating for something or you're trying to hide something or you're trying to, I don't know, put on a mask or you're insecure about whatever. Or you're playing Um, by the man's rules because men want the women made up, right? Yes, that's another thing. Um, A lot of people say I'm only wearing certain clothes or certain makeup because it appeals to men or I'm just trying to get men watching me. And and I'm like, you realize my viewers are 75% women, right? Like, they're not watching me because I might have a bit of cleavage. They're watching me because they care about things I have to say. 
Um, I don't wear my clothes or my makeup for anyone other than myself. And I think that's hard for a lot of people to understand. Um, but when you're anonymous online, it's very easy to, I don't know, make assumptions about people and think that your words aren't affecting them. But, you know, there are things that I'm insecure about, like my teeth or, um, okay, mostly my teeth, just my teeth. <laughs> and when people pick up on those things, yeah, it does hit you quite hard. But at the same time, it is making me stronger. So it's weird. And there's also a lot of assumptions made about you as well, um, about really personal things. So like you'd never go up to someone in real life and say, okay, I think you've had this partners and your vagina looks like this but I get those 10 times a day online like not even an exaggeration it's literally that much um and it's really bizarre and that definitely took some getting used to learning how to ignore that stuff is this their way of trying to just uh, remove you from the conversation is is it a form um, this is a rhetorical I, I, question I know the answer is this a form <laughs> of sexism and of course the answer is yes yeah um, I, I think they're trying to essentially objectify me and just like, you know, if they don't like something I'm saying, they're like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. She's just a walking vagina, you know? Yeah. Um, or if they don't like that I've called them out on something, or maybe something I've said has made them feel insecure or made them question something about themselves, well, it doesn't matter. I'm just a vagina. You know, like my arguments shouldn't be taken seriously because vagina. Um, and obviously that's stupid, but that says a lot more about them than it does about me. Do you have any thoughts on sexism in the 20th, 21st century? I mean, you know, you have um, the patriarchy, those types of terms. I don't know. Do you want to go down mm. that rabbit hole? Do you have any thoughts? I, I, yeah, we can do. Um, I definitely would call myself more of a liberal feminist than a radical feminist. But like we spoke about earlier, the word feminist has a lot of connotations now, not all of which are good. So it's very difficult to... I guess kind of come out as a feminist in some ways. A lot of people hear that and they immediately just switch off. I think someone like me is very, very lucky in where I live and the rights I have. And if the worst I'm getting from the patriarchy, if you want to call it that, is that some people will insult my appearance online, that's absolutely fine. Like I can deal with that. I can man up. I can get over it. The real kind of places where we should be concentrating on rights for women, I think are rights for transgender women in all societies. I think we should be concentrating on uh, women who have to put up with like female genital mutilation in other countries, um, women who aren't allowed to get an education, women who are forced into covering up and wearing burqas and all sorts of stuff when they don't want to. They're the issues that feminists should really be focusing on. And I think to... <sighs> I don't want to trivialise things like getting hate comments online, but to me... They just aren't a priority like the other issues are. You feel you know? like you, while many Western feminists are chewing each other's ribbons over whether you should shave mm -hmm. your armpits or whatever, you've got the burqa, you know, the hijab, you've yeah. got the covering, the marginal, the dehumanization of women in yeah. Islamic theocracies. Proportionality does come into play here, doesn't it? Yeah. I think it's very easy to get into Twitter wars with people over should you wear this lipstick or not? Should you buy from this brand or not? Should you shave this bit of hair or not? Like, it's easy to get in those kinds of arguments because they're things that lots of people on Twitter have to deal with and everyone has an opinion on it and it's easy to have an opinion. It's harder to have the conversations about cultures that you don't see every day, but they're where the big issues are and they're where the women really need our help and men. There are plenty of men who need help as well. Um, when people are literally put to death for being gay, that's not okay. And to me, that is a feminist issue that needs something doing about it. Um, it's just kind of making sure we have those conversations and trying to stop people hating on each other for the sake of it because they aren't the right type of feminist and saying, like... <sighs> It's tough because I don't want to say that, you know, one person's suffering doesn't count because there's worse suffering out there. That's not at all what I'm saying. Um, for one person to be, like, sad about something that's happened to them is more than okay. And obviously, they deserve love and kindness and support. But I think generally, when we're talking about the big picture, there are certain areas that I'd like to see focused on a little bit more and others that I we kind of need to move on from.
I've got a call on the switchboard. I've got 262. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? I sure can. What's your name? Hi. My name's Nick. Um, I wanted to uh, just say uh, this has been a fantastic interview. Thank you. You're doing a wonderful Aww. job. Um, Thank you. I wanted to piggyback off of um, what you said earlier about skepticism and uh, the anti-vax movement and such. Um, well, whenever somebody uh, wants to present uh, argument against science, they have to do several things. But uh, one of two things they can do is either present counter evidence, um, which there isn't any counter evidence against uh, vaccines or anything like that. And they can present uh, why they think there's a flaw in the study. Um, and this ties back to what you said about the scientific method. People are ignorant of it. They don't realize how it works. And so um, when somebody presents a scientific study, you'll find a lot of people, especially online, just say, oh, that's bunk. That's dumb. And that's that's not really an argument against it. Um, I've pressed people on presenting why they think it's it's dumb. Why do you think this uh, this is false, and they have no evidence to back it up as to why they think that. Um, more more often than not, um, a lot of people are just brought up in a culture of, of ignorance, and uh, they they kind of go with the the wave of things, uh, especially online. Um, you know, with the internet, with false information spreading, a lot of people just get caught up in this this wave of ignorance without actually investigating anything, without actually doing the work. And um, so um, in my experience and from what I know, um, if you actually want to um, counter something that's scientific, you actually have to explain why there's a flaw in the study or you have to present counter evidence that puts this other study into question. Um, and there's other method, methods as well, but um, I so, just wanted to, to piggyback off that. So you're saying that, that looking them in the eye and saying that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Is probably not the best way to change their mind. Is that what you're saying? No, no. Oh, okay. um, people are going to double down more often than not. Um, there was a there was mm -hmm. a neurobiological study where they actually showed when uh, people were presented counter evidence to their political beliefs, their brains at, actually changed to cleave onto their current belief. So people people are going to double down when you look at them look at them in the eye and say you're an idiot, you're dumb, you're stupid. Um, more, you know, it's, it's a line of communication. You have to be able to not only be understanding, say, you know, and, and sh but showing compassion, um, yeah. and, and be understanding in your form of communication. You have a gentle approach will often go a longer ways than a harsh approach. Um, well, I like this and, guy. And I think yeah. he's talking. I completely agree that. So. Yeah. There, there's, there's room. There's a little bit of room um, for parody and things like that because I know a lot of atheists will use parody as jokes and things like that, and and that's fine. Comedy is important, but if you're having a serious discussion, if you really want to change somebody's mind, you actually have to go to the heart of the matter, and you have to see, you mm -hmm. have to see people as people, um, yeah. and more often than not, people don't see ideas separated from people. And so ideas are like babies, you know, we, we kind of cater to them. So when people actually cater to these ideas, they hold them near and dear. And so if you tell these, if you tell somebody your ideas are dumb, they're going to take it extremely personal. So you have to keep that in mind that these ideas are like babies to them. They come from them. They hold them personal. Yeah. These are their beliefs. And I think with atheists or um, like with atheists, they, we don't have any sacred cows necessarily. We don't, we don't, we think ideas should be challenged. We think ideas should be trampled on if necessary. Um, but other people such as uh, Christians or, you know, Muslims or whatever, they, they hold these ideas as sacred. So if you, attack them because in your mind these aren't sacred but to them it is it's gonna it's going to hurt them they're going to take offense to it they're not going to be like oh you know what you called me an idiot i'm i'm dumb i can't believe i thought of that you're right no they're they're gonna 
be offended and double down. Yeah, I get that. Um, yeah. So, you know, if you walk up to, if Rachel walks up to someone and says, so why do you drink your own pee? What health benefit does that bring? What demonstrable health benefit does the, what would you call it? Urine, urine what? Urine therapy. Shit. Urine yeah, therapy is what they call it. Rather than say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, perhaps getting them to explain and defend where they're at from a position of even empathy, not empathy for the idea, yeah. but empathy for the person who is a victim of a bad yeah. idea. And I think, you know, you speak to a lot of good stuff. The backfire effect is it's mm -hmm. real. And, I, you know, if you'd come to me when I was a believer and said, you're an idiot for believing in God, I'd have doubled down just to show you. I wouldn't yeah. have felt <laughs> safe. I think, you know, people a, a change big, their minds from a position of safety and if they feel you know yeah. sort of mental mentally like they're being attacked they'll double down go ahead rachel i'm sorry yeah. that's okay um, i was gonna say i think a big thing you have to remember when it comes to things like anti-vax is that a lot of the people are parents who care about their kid and they're worried about the safety of their kid and just calling them stupid or throwing facts in their face isn't going to necessarily change their mind you have to get to the heart of the matter and say no if you want to protect your child and other children and other people, this is what you have to do. And then show them the science because, you know, they're not yeah. bad people. They're not trying to be wrong. You just have to figure out what they care about and make sure they understand kind of how to look after their kids the best they can. You know, appreciate your call, my friend. Thank you so yeah. much for being a part of the conversation. Thank you. So what are you working on next? What happens in the months ahead as we get into the final few months of 2019? Um, well, I've got a couple more videos coming out on Kent Hovind. So there's that. <laughs> you just turn um, in that screw. I'm, You're like, yeah. oh, the man's about to pop I an O-ring. I guess I'll produce more content I'm with him. Just That's pushing it. You know, I've got the book to finish. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm going ahead with my plan no matter what he does. Um, I just let him kind of like scream into the void for a bit longer. Um, so I've got that. I'm working on a series of videos on like the science of beauty at the minute which is taking a look at all the kind of like beauty and makeup and skincare products that people use on a daily basis and saying, okay, well, how does this stuff actually work? Does it work at all? Is it any good for your skin or your face or your body or whatever? Like what is happening when you use this stuff? Um, which is quite interesting. I've got, got an episode coming out on exfoliators very soon, which oh. is more interesting than it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it's a weird mix. Your content is Let's debunk young earth creationism. Oh, hey, let's exfoliate. Oh, let's talk about the people who drink their pee. Oh, here's some lipstick. Uh, I saw that you had some themed makeup. You have uh, superhero makeup, like uh, modeled after Wonder Woman and Aquaman and Catwoman. I like my comic books. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting potpourri that you pull off on your channel. How do people find you? YouTube, uh, Twitter, Instagram, how do they find you? Um. As in, how should they find me? How or can they find you? Where how do can they find, they find me? Where okay. do you exist? Um, I, um, oh God, I've forgotten everywhere I am now. Um, so I'm on YouTube at Rachel Oates, which is O-A-T-E-S. Um, I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Instagram's probably the one I use most. That's Rachel Oates, but with a zero instead of an O because I'm annoying. Um, but yeah, Instagram is kind of like the big one where I post... Um, lots of dog pictures and makeup pictures and um, I post a lot about the books I'm reading and on my story I post a lot of like quotes from the books I read and stuff like that um, so you can kind of really keep up to date with me there and I've also got a website which is racheloats.me where I post it's basically like my big online hub of everything I do like so I have links to my YouTube channel there my merch store there I've got a big about me section if people want to find out more about my history and who I am and my education and then stuff i've got photographs that i've taken on there paintings that i've done a little bit of everything really so i'm a very big kind of eclectic bundle of everything just jammed into one person and you can kind of find it all on the website you can experience the eclectic <laughs> bundle that is rachel oates i will include <laughs> at least the link to your uh, twitter and your instagram in the description box of this broadcast it's been a great conversation i'll point some new uh, listeners and viewers your direction and thank you so very much Thank you so much for having me. This has been really, really fun. Thank you. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. 
For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.